Are you a dedicated Micro Terrors listener? Then become one of the terrified by joining the Micro Terrors fan club. All members receive a welcome pack in the mail that includes a collectible Micro Terrors trading card, a Micro Terrors bookmark, printable games, coloring pages, and a personalized Micro Terror story with you as the main character. With two different membership levels to choose from, you can also enjoy commercial free episodes, read stories a week early, participate in polls, receive complimentary paperback copies of all Micro Terror books in the mail when they release, as well as enjoy discounted pricing on previously released books, and communicate directly with Micro Terror's writer and creator, Scott Donnelly. Become one of the terrified today at microterrors.com. Welcome to Micro Terrors. Scary stories for kids. Where it's always the spooky season. Full of chills. Thrills. And spine tingling spooks. Micro Terrors are family friendly frights for those ages 8 and up. And while our stories are for younger ears, we are still talking about things that go bump in the night. And some children may not be able to handle what others can. Parental consent is recommended. Now, for tonight's Micro Terror. The Grove City Werewolf, Part 1. Written by Scott Donnelly. August was in full swing in Grove City, Ohio. A late October chill creeped through the night air, stirring up leaves and rustling the naked branches of the trees in Andrea Cordell's backyard. Sitting by her crackling fire pit, and wrapped tightly in an Ohio State football hoodie, she typed on her laptop, putting the final touches on her Trick or Treat Safety Tips article for the Grove City Messenger, the local publication she worked for. Her phone rang silencing the crickets in her backyard, and she answered it. Hello? She said. Andrea, I just wanted to check to see how the werewolf article was coming, a man's voice said. Andrea sighed. I told you I'm not doing the werewolf article. I don't believe in things like that, and I feel like this town has gotten itself worked up into a little panic over nothing. It's the spooky season, she said. Of course something like this would be trying to make headlines around town. It sounds like a fluff piece to me. Andrea? The man said. I think we need to cover it. There's a curfew in effect. The police don't put a curfew in effect for fluff pieces. Andrea sighed. But before she could respond, she heard something in the trees. Her backyard hugged to the edge of a small wooded area. Hold on, she whispered into the phone. Andrea held the phone down by her side and tried to focus her eyes on the dark tree line ahead of her. Everything went silent, aside from the crackling fire. Then, without warning, a vicious, arcane howl erupted from the woods. Andrea panicked and jumped to her feet. She ran for the back door of her house. That's when she heard the heavy, persistent gallop of a large animal behind her. Clamoring through the backyard after her, snarling wickedly, she blew through the back door and slammed it shut. As Andrea tried to settle her nerves and catch her breath, she heard the haunting howl of the unseen beast again, echoing in the cold night outside. After the 45-minute trip, Sean Dyer's family car finally came to a stop. With his father behind the wheel and his mother in the passenger seat, they pulled into the driveway of a small little house off Kingston Avenue in Grove City, Ohio. Sean's dad turned the engine off and opened his door. His mother did the same, but Sean remained seated, strapped in with his seatbelt, nervous to leave the comforts of the family car. "'You coming?' his dad called back in, a cool rush of the crisp autumn air slipping in through the open door. Sean sighed. Even though he didn't want to, even though he wanted to go with his parents to North Carolina for the weekend, instead of staying with family that he barely ever saw, 
he knew it was a lost cause. The plane tickets were already paid for, only two of them, and his aunt and uncle were expecting them. Chances were they had probably already noticed the car pull into the driveway. Sean glanced out the window and up to the house. His aunt and uncle, who he hadn't seen in about two years, were standing on the porch, waving with huge smiles on their faces. Yep, they already knew. It didn't take long for Sean's parents to get him settled in, unpacked and reacquainted with his dad's brother and his wife. Uncle Curtis was a good man, with a good job. He liked bad movies, even worse music, and still favored the video games of his youth to the ones of today, well into his thirties. His wife, Aunt Jade, was as friendly as someone could be. Sean hadn't been in their home for two minutes before Aunt Jade had offered to make him hot chocolate and homemade pumpkin cookies. As much as Sean wanted to feel comfortable, he struggled. It's only for the weekend, he told himself. Then Mom and Dad will be back and I'll be heading home, just in time for Halloween. Sean's parents had been gone for only an hour when Sean felt the first nervous butterfly in his stomach. It was like the butterfly was lost, tying aimless knots inside of him. He was homesick. Sean found his way outside and sat on the porch steps. He breathed in the cool autumn air, watched the leaves trickle down from the trees, and took a gander at the Halloween decorations his aunt and uncle's neighbors had on full display. It was the first time he felt like smiling, but still couldn't muster up the energy to do so. The front door behind him opened and Uncle Curtis came out, sitting down next to Sean with a cup of steaming hot chai tea in his hands. Do it okay? he asked. Sean nodded. Uncle Curtis took a small sip from his tea and looked around the neighborhood. I love this neighborhood at Halloween time, he said, looking at the blowing spiderweb decorations across the street, the inflatable vampire Bluey next door to it, and the skeletal spider that had been fastened atop a nearby mailbox. It reminds me of the neighborhood your dad and I grew up in. Uncle Curtis looked down to Sean and, after another sip of tea, said, I still can't believe he's moving you all to North Carolina. I wish he wasn't, Sean said. I like Ohio. Uncle Curtis took a deep breath. Me too, especially Grove City. I've lived here with Aunt Jade for nearly a decade now. It's the perfect small town feel, but close enough to everything big, it's the best of both worlds. Sean didn't seem interested, and Uncle Curtis noticed. He smiled. I'll take you for a tour tomorrow, Uncle Curtis said. Just you and me. Jade has some work stuff to do anyways. I'll show you all the cool things around town. There's a comic book store, parks, some of the best pizza you'll ever have. Uncle Curtis trailed off on his pizza comment, and Sean couldn't tell if it was because he was trying to think of other places to mention or that he now had a hankering for pizza. Just then, the sound of footsteps crunching through leaves caught Sean's attention. He looked up and saw a mail carrier, a middle-aged man dressed in the standard blue uniform and carrying a satchel filled with letters and small parcels, walking through the neighbor's yard and into his aunt and uncle's. Uncle Curtis stood up. Good afternoon, Jeff! He greeted his neighborhood mailman with a smile. Jeff, the mailman, briefly eyed the sky. The sun was already heading toward the horizon, leaving a bright orange glow in the sky. More like evening, Jeff said, handing Curtis a handful of letters. Just trying to get done before dark. Sean noticed something strange in Jeff's tone when he mentioned trying to get done before dark. It didn't seem to come from a place of work-related distress, but from somewhere else. Curtis's demeanor changed as well. His friendly greeting trailed off, just as his pizza comment did moments earlier. Be safe, Jeff. Get back and get home as soon as you can. Jeff nodded with a smile. This is my last street before I'm done, so I think I'm in the clear. Hopefully. Curtis smiled. See you tomorrow. You too. Jeff smiled and then nodded in Sean's direction before moving on to the next house. As Curtis sat back down on the porch step, Sean kept his eye on Jeff, hurrying through the leaf-covered yard. Jeff's been our mail carrier for years. Curtis said to Sean. Good guy. He just lost his brother a couple of weeks back. He hasn't met himself since then. 
I can't imagine losing someone that close to me. Sean didn't verbally respond, but just watched Jeff cross the yard into the next one. The neighbor's front door opened, and a dog rushed out to greet Jeff with a friendly wag of its tail. A man appeared at the door next. He looked to be in his late twenties. The man accepted a handful of mail from Jeff before the nervous mailman hurried on his way again. The neighbor then turned and waved to Sean. Sean hesitantly waved back, and Curtis noticed. "'That's Reese,' Curtis said. He's lived there since before Jane and I moved in. Nice guy. He's doing some work in his attic that he keeps asking my help with, but I keep finding new ways to blow him off." <laughs> Reese rounded up his dog, and the two of them disappeared back into their house. "'He's got a nice dog,' Sean said. "'Most dogs I know hate the mailman.' <laughs> "'Yeah. Bongo is one of a kind.' "'Bongo?' <laughs> Sean laughed, realizing that he had finally broken a smile. And it felt good. Curtis, noticing this as well, decided to capitalize on a craving that had been building within him. "'Want pizza for dinner?' he asked. "'There's a place on Broadway called Tabby's Pizza. It's the best you'll ever have, I promise!' Sean smiled again. "'I could eat some pizza!' "'Pizza it is!' Curtis said, standing up and swallowing the last gulp of his tea. He looked to the sunset and his tone slightly changed again. We'd better hurry, though. It'll be dark soon. Sean couldn't help but wonder, why did everyone seem so nervous about the dark? Uncle Curtis pulled his car along the curb of Broadway, right in front of Tammy's Pizza. The establishment was much smaller than Sean would have predicted, but he'd always been told the smaller the place, the better the food. I'll be right back, Curtis said, turning off the car and taking the keys with him. As soon as he opened the car door to leave, Sean could already smell the pizza, and it smelled incredible. While his uncle went inside to pick up and pay for it, Sean looked out the windows, getting his first real look at downtown Grove City. It did have that small-town feel like his uncle had said. Shops, restaurants, and businesses lined both sides of Broadway. Festival fall flags hung on the light poles, and Halloween decorations sat inside the glass windows of the businesses. The orange glow in the sky had become blinding for a moment, and then dulled. The sun had set, and the lingering light made the sky look beautiful. However, it wouldn't last long. It was just after 6 p.m., and it would be dark very soon. There was a knock on the passenger window, which startled a gasp from Sean. He looked up and saw a uniformed police officer. Once Sean caught his breath, he cracked the door open, a familiar knot of nerves running to his stomach. Yes? he asked. Where are your parents? the officer asked. M My uncle's in there, Sean said, pointing behind the officer to Tammy's Pizza. He's getting our dinner. The officer turned around just in time to see Curtis coming out with two large pizzas in his hands. Is there a problem, officer? Curtis asked. Sun's setting, the officer said. There's a curfew in effect. Unless you have to be on the road, you shouldn't be. I understand, Curtis said. We're on our way home now, actually. The officer nodded. He looked back down at Sean and then addressed Curtis. Keep your nephew safe, he said. I will, Curtis replied. The officer then walked away, and Curtis sat the pizzas in the back seat of the car. He climbed into the driver's seat and started it up. "'Why is there a curfew?' Sean asked curiously. Curtis didn't answer for a minute. "'There's... there's just been some strange things happening around here lately.' He turned to Sean and faked a smile. "'Nothing to worry about.' Curtis faced forward and stepped on the gas. He pulled out into traffic and drove the two of them home. Oddly, he didn't mention anything else about the curfew which only made Sean more curious. A little over an hour later, across town, Grove City's coolest store, Skylark's Toys and Comics, saw its last customer of the night leave. Darren Neff, the store's bearded, humble owner, adjusted his ball cap, which sported the Skylark's logo, and then locked the door. He peered out into the night, 
but couldn't see much because of the glare from the light inside the store. He turned off the buzzing open sign, locked the door, and then returned to his place behind the counter. The cash register opened, and Darren began to count the drawer. Then something in his peripheral vision caught his eye. Ahead of him, down an aisle of vintage Ninja Turtles and Power Rangers toys, and out the front windows, a large shadow passed by. Darren waited to see if whoever it was would walk back again, but things out in front of the store seemed still. He went back to counting his cash drawer. Suddenly he was interrupted by a sharp, strident scratching sound on the glass, as if someone were dragging the tines of a metal rake across it. Hey, hey, stop it! Darren shouted, rushing out from behind the counter and to the locked side of his door. The scratching sound had come to an abrupt stop. Darren squinted and peered outside, but the store's lights still made it hard to see anything in the night. Suddenly Darren watched a set of piercing yellow eyes ignite on the other side of the glass and then narrow into a menacing leer. He saw a flash of sharp teeth next and then… crash! The window exploded inward. A massive hairy beast plowed through along with the shattering glass. It snarled, gnashed its jaws, and thrashed its claws. The attack was quick. Afterward, Skylark's toys and comics sat in an eerie silence. Only the scampering, galloping footsteps of the beast could be heard fleeing from the scene. Then it released a horrible howl into the night. Tune in next week for part two of the Micro Terror's four week Halloween event, The Grove City Werewolf. Thank you for listening to Micro Terrors. Join us each Saturday for another scary story. For more fun, Visit our website at microterrors.com, where you can get the latest Micro Terrors news, read fun facts about each story, sign up for our monthly newsletter, and even send in your own scary story for us to tell. Plus, you can become one of the terrified by joining the fan club at microterrors.com to enjoy exclusive perks like reading stories a week early receiving complimentary books, and communicating directly with Micro Terror's writer and creator Scott Donnelly. You can also follow us on Facebook and Instagram using the handle at Micro Terrors. I hope you'll join us again soon for Micro Terrors, scary stories for kids. Attention, young mystery seekers. Are you ready to dive deeper into the world of the unknown? If you love the spooky tales from Micro Terrors, you're going to die for Creepy Clubhouse. Creepy Clubhouse is a monthly book subscription box that brings the most thrilling, spine-tingling stories right to your doorstep. Each box is packed with books and gifts that feature a new theme every month, from aliens to Bigfoot to the Bermuda Triangle. Perfect for brave listeners like you who can't get enough of the chills and thrills. And because you're a part of the Micro Terrors family, we've got a special treat just for you. Use the promo code TERROR10 to get 10% off your first Creepy Clubhouse subscription box order. Don't miss out on this eerie adventure, where every box is a doorway into the unknown. Visit CreepyClubhouse.com and remember to use your exclusive code TERROR10. Join the club. Embrace the creepy.